Now, when it comes to rounding numbers, because we're gonna practice problems together using um, the sig fig rules. When it comes to rounding, um, because ultimately at the end of the day, we're going to have measurements, um, something like a, a, a volume where we're going to take three sides of a cube and we're going to say, okay, this side had three sig figs, this side had three sig figs, this side had three sig figs. You multiply it all into your calculator and you're going to get this really big number. First off, make sure that you do not round until you have your final answer. Once you have your final answer, that's when you're going to apply rounding rules to determine what your final answer's significant figures are. So your book goes into really good detail and shows you some examples about multiplication, division, and addition, and subtraction, rounding rules. In general, here's how we're going to do it. For multiplication and division, it's super simple. Look at any of your measurements that you have taken as part of your multiplication or division problem. Find the one that has the least number of significant figures, and then you're going to use th that number of signif significant figures as the number of significant figures your final answer should have. So if the smallest measurement that you have has two significant figures and all the rest of them have four sig figs, congratulations, your answer is going to have two sig figs. For addition and subtraction, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. What you're going to need to do, and we're going to practice these in class, what you're going to need to do is line up your addition and subtraction problems so in that nice vertical way that you have done previously and make sure that your decimals line up you're going to have your final answer is going to have the same number of decimal places as your least precise measurement the, the key takeaway here is you are going to have uh, different rules for multiplication division versus addition and subtraction and it's going to be incumbent upon you to remember how to do those sig fig rules with the addition and subtraction because that's the little bit that's the more tricky one honestly we're going to practice problems uh face to face to help orient you with that now i talked about precision a little bit let's articulate a little bit more about uh, the difference between accuracy and precision your book gives you an example of a uh, target, like a bow and arrow target, um, and it says, well, here's all the dots. Here's what this, and that's, that's a perfectly great example, but what does accuracy and precision, what might they look like in a laboratory setting? Well, what you're seeing is three different data sets. Okay, so data set one, data set two, and data set three. The different sets here have four measurements in each of them. So measurement one, two, three, four. They all have the same data scale here on the left. So the axis uh, is four to 5.4 for all of these. Whenever we're looking at data, we always want to look at our axes to figure out what is the data actually telling us. If we can figure out what the axes are telling us, then the data will make a lot more sense to us. Looking at the data first is not usually a great way of looking at a graph, even though most of us do it that way. Let's look at this data set. The 5.1 represents, and I apologize for not having units here, Let's say that that represents the average density that was taken um, by a student of the same kind of sample. So we have in data set one, measurement one of the density, measurement two of the density, measurement three of the density, measurement four of the density. Now you would rightfully expect that if you went into a lab and you were measuring the density of the same thing four times, you'd end up with the same number four times. Well, this student didn't. The student ended up with, or professor, this student, or professor, person, you might say, ended up with four different values for the density of an object. And they are kind of all over the place. This data would represent data that is not accurate, nor is it precise. If the real value of the material's density was five, 
we have some data that's way too dense and some that's way not dense enough for these measurements. So this data is really not good. It's not consistent. It's neither accurate because accuracy would represent how close you are to the actual value. And it's not precise because precision would represent how repeatable your measurements are. Here, because these measurements are all over the place, those measurements are not repeatable. They didn't, they weren't replicable um, consistently. So it's not repeatable, not replicable, so it's not precise, and it's not accurate because our average ended up being a pretty decent amount above what the true density of the material was. If we go to our third, our second data set, now we have numbers that are all pretty close to one another, but they're all, the average is lower than what the actual density of the material was. The actual density was five. Well, this data is precise. The data point that is taken is repeatable because look, there's not that much variation between the, even the highest and the lowest data point here. It's all got a nice little tight clustering in terms of our four measurements. Now we have an error going on because we keep getting pretty similar uh, information, but that information is too low compared to what the real number is. So this data is precise, but it is not accurate. The kind of error that we have here for this graph is an error that is called a systematic error. We're systematically doing something wrong, and so we keep getting the incorrect number. Whereas before, in the first data set, we have a random error. We're just randomly doing something wrong, and it's really difficult. It was going to be very difficult to figure out what we're doing wrong. Whereas over here with a systematic error, we can say, oh, well, we just always use the balance wrong in the exact same way or something like that. Now, finally, in our last data set, we have something that is both accurate and precise. Our average just coincidentally happens to land right at exactly what the true value of the density is. And we can see in our data, we're having some fluctuations in the numbers, but they're all pretty nice, tightly or a nice little tight spacing there. So it's precise data or precise measurements that we're taking, and they seem to be accurate as well. So that's going to cover our uh, additional video content for section 1.5 of your textbook. If you have any questions, please let me know. And thank you very much.